Thank you so, so much. Come on, somebody give glory to Jesus right now. We love you, Lord. Woo! 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 Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Please have your seats. Um, I'm still, I think I got stuck on domestic. I'm like, I'm still trying to figure out what that means. <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm still trying to figure that one out. So like, yeah, yeah. But I, I'll talk to Benway Money after this and figure out what that means. Good morning, everybody. It, I'm so glad to see everybody. Hasn't, that, has to, hasn't today been amazing already? Yeah, God is in the house, and I'm so, so glad for every single one of you here. My heart aches to see this place full, because I know there are over, I mean, there, there are thousands of people in Mavuno Church, and I can't wait for the day the congregation becomes the army. Yeah, and it's happening. It's happening. You're the first fruits. You're the first fruits. Those of you who are watching right now in the different uh, uh, gatherings, you're the first fruits. You're the first fruits of the army that God is raising. There's an army rising up. You know that song? There's an army rising up. There's an army. There's an army rising up. To do what? To break every chain, to break every chain, to break every chain. Can you tell that chains are breaking in this place? Yeah. Amen. And you know what? Chains are actually broken. The stuff we're talking about, the stuff we're going through, it's not theory. When those hugs were given, chains were broken. Not they are breaking, they were broken. Like God actually actively healed people yesterday. And so for those of you who, had, who made those resolutions, I have moved forward. I have received that hug. I am no longer an orphan. It is done. It's not even something you doubt and even start going back to. The healing will not take a few other days. It's already happened. And you're a different person already. And so I'm excited to see the chains are breaking and God is healing. And even for those of you who are online, if this is your experience as well, chains are broken in Jesus' name. And this morning I saw a, people, a few people smiling the way I've never seen them smile before. Did you see anybody smiling like you're like, hey, is this the same person? Like there's healing that is happening and God is the one who's bringing it about. So I, I, I have no doubt the Lord is the one who's just given this focus. I didn't know what Pastor Milton was going to pray about as well, uh, but it's exciting. I mean, for me, one of the things I love about the, the gathering, it's a free fall. We don't over strategize it. We sort of just flow with the Holy Spirit. And I love it. I've been a very structured and strategic person all my life. So I'm really enjoying this space of just, come on, just release. Let's see what the Lord does with it. And it's been a lot of fun. How many of you like control? You like to be in control? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's nice to be in control. Uh, but it's also nice sometimes to release yourself to your father and let him just flow. So even today, by the way, I have no idea what the outcome of today will be. I'm so excited about that. I don't even know what Papa is planning for us today. But I know it's going to be amazing. Tell your neighbor, it's going to be amazing. <laughs> Yeah, it's going to be so, so amazing. And um, yeah, so we want to talk now. I mean, we're, we're, first of all, let me just say, you are sons and daughters. Yeah, yeah. you are sons and daughters. You're in, your, you're in the house of your father, God, but this is also your home, your earthly home, your spiritual home, earthly home. And so you are sons and daughters. And even if your feelings are yet to catch up, that's okay. That's okay. They will come. It is an objective reality. They will come. Sometimes, some of you got saved and you, you didn't feel saved for a while. <laughs> Am I talking to somebody in the house? You got saved, you thought angels would blow trumpets and you would be transported somewhere. Nothing happened and you went home thinking, did anything change? But with time you began to realize something had actually changed. And so there is change that has already happened. You are sons and daughters. And so today I want to move us a bit deeper. Tell your neighbor, we're going deeper. Yeah, we're going deeper and we're going to just get a bit deeper. We're, the lights are coming on. You're going to start comprehending certain things the way you haven't. I'm going to push you in some areas maybe you haven't thought about because God wants us to go deeper. He loves us just the way we are, but he loves us too much to leave us that way. Yeah, he, there, there are things that God wants to do uh, among us. And so I want us to uh, turn to Mark chapter 1, verse 16 to 18. And there's a, a, a scripture there um, that I want us to read. Because it talks about something very astounding. You know, sometimes we read scripture because we know the story. It's not as shocking. 
Maybe you've read it before. You're, not, you're, you're, you're kind of like looking at something that should actually be very surprising, but you don't get surprised because you assume it. So I want us to read a very common part of Scripture that usually wouldn't surprise you, but I tell you, just read it with imagination and you will see some surprising things in it. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, Mark chapter 1, verse 16 to 18, he, that is Jesus, saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. What a shock. <laughs> That's what fishermen do. Then Jesus said to them, come on, let's go. Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Isn't that interesting? It's James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Not James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Isn't that a bit weird? I don't, I don't, know, what, I don't know what that is. He saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who are also in the boat mending their nets. Are you ready? And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him. Now, I want us to, today we're going to be, a, we're going to talk a bit. We're going to discuss a bit, because I feel like some of these things need to be pulled out through us talking and through us conversing. Yeah? I mean, imagine you're Jesus. Just keep the text up there. Imagine you're Jesus, and you are in the journey of creating the army, raising the people who are going to change the world. You're looking to enlist some serious disciples. Now, these guys, these guys, he's walking by the sea and he sees some fishermen. Imagine you're you, it's you, and you're just walking by and you see some guys casting some nets somewhere, doing some stuff. What would have made it hard for you? I'm talking about you, not Jesus, you. Imagine it's you. What would have made it hard for you, if it was today, to recruit these particular people? Is the question clear? Yeah. You're walking, you've been told it's time for you to recruit some people. Maybe you're in Mashariki and Pastor Milton has said, recruit a discipleship group. Wow. And you're walking somewhere. And imagine you put yourself in this situation. You see some guys casting their net just like Jesus. What would make it very hard for you to pick this particular people? that Jesus has come across. So I want you to turn to the person next to you. Have a bit of a conversation. Give, give each other, like, give, each of you should come up with at least two reasons why this would just be not a very easy uh, conversation for Jesus to have. What would have made it hard for you to pick these particular ones? If you're watching in a watch party, have that conversation as well. What would make it hard for you? If you're watching alone, make a list. What are some of those things? I'm going to give you just a few minutes. Make your own list. What will make it hard for you to pick these particular people? Just let's put some sanctified imagination into this passage. So we've got some mics, do we? Where are my technical crew? I want to just get a few to sample a few answers here. There's some of you who have some brilliant answers, so I want to hear. Okay, there's one a mic over here. Do you have somebody on this other side with a mic? Okay, fantastic. All right. Uh, great. Excellent. All right. I, just put up your hand if you've got an hand. Okay, there's somebody over there as well. Uh, Lucas, there's somebody at the back. Just make sure. All right, Pastor Mills, just stand up and then tell us what would have made it hard if it was you. Uh, I think verse 20, um, where it says, they left their father Zebedee in the boat with hired servants. Yeah. It means their business was thriving. They were doing well. They could employ other people. Wow. So getting them out of their business to follow me would really be a, a challenge. So you've, you've found guys who are in a family business. They are obviously doing well. They have servants. 
Like, those are not the guys you'd ask. You'd be like, this one's already a caught up, isn't it? They're busy. They have a plan. It's not like they're just idling around, waiting to be asked by somebody. Usually, you'd look for people who are looking a bit idle. Like, they're looking like they have nothing better to do, but not busy people who are thriving. They're succeeding in what they're doing, all right? Uh, for me, I wouldn't go for them because, one, um, if I'm looking for people who know the word of God, I'll go to the temple, not to, ah. <laughs> not to where the fishermen are. So, uh, they were the least qualified people. Oh, my goodness. Isn't that powerful? Like you're looking for people to change the world and to, to, be, to be God's servants to change the world. You don't start in the fishermen. You go to the temple. There are guys in the temple who've been trained, who have some theology, who understand the word. You don't go to funny guys who are catching fish. You don't start with funny guys out there. You look for guys who look like they know something, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh huh. Um, if you put yourself in the situation in today's life, like... You'll not go anywhere, look at people, see they're at work, then you just approach them and tell them to come and follow you. <laughs> They'll be like, dude, we don't know you. <laughs> yeah. And then, if you look at them, like they don't look like they're into Christianity or something. Yeah. So they'll be like, no, thanks, I think I'll pass. Yeah, yeah, I'll pass. I mean, you're going and finding guys busy at work, a mechanic fixing his car, somebody in the, a lawyer writing his brief, and you're saying, stop what you're doing, follow me. Like, who does that? I mean, that's a harsh thing. I can see some people are using sanctified imagination in the house. Huh? All right, let's ask some, one on this side, then we'll come back. The middle guys here have a lot of action, but we'll come. Oh, okay, before we get there, let's start with somebody on that side. Um, hi. Hi. My neighbor here say that um, it's, it, it will be hard to approach someone you don't know. Yeah. Fast, because you're like, you would want to know them, get to know how they uh, feel, how uh -huh. they think. And then now you can tell them, let's go. And apart from that, you, oh, sorry, that work. And then so it's hard to, to, chomo, or to remove them from that space and take them to a different space. And especially when you... He's lapsing into tongues. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you know, it's for Benway money since... Uh, um, because you, you see, uh, being fishermen at that time, it was the key thing. And I would look at them, let me say it's someone who's maybe in an investment banker or someone in that mm. space, and then you'd be like, this person, for him to leave that, to go and look after humans and get human beings to come to God and yeah. everything, yeah. just to be... It's hard to ask people yeah, like that. Exactly. Yeah. And I like even what he said, that you, you've not, usually you want to have tested them, you've taken them through some serious school, You've seen that they've performed, they have, you know, they've worked, they've served, they've done things. Then you're like, these ones are trustworthy. Yeah? But he just calls them. I mean, it's like, who does that? That's a bit crazy. Usually we want qualified people. All right, sir. Uh -huh, and then we'll come back to this side. Is it me? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I was just bouncing off ideas with her here. And uh, I feel the Bible is a very prophetic book, um, which for you to understand the Bible, you must understand life. And uh, in this day and age, you, I just can't walk to you and tell you, let's go. And I, I have a vivid experience where I have approached a couple of youths just to mentor them. I'm like, I've seen your work online. You can do this better if you yeah. do it this way. But they're like, dude, I know my thing. Yeah. So we find the, the, the <laughs> current generation, and um, I'm, I'm speaking with authority here. Yeah. I've approached several youths just to mentor them. I'm like, I've been there. Can I mentor you? Yeah. They flop and they come back when it's too late. Yeah. So for this is very, very powerful. It teaches us on how to trust other people. And for me, I believe there are angels down here on earth, not in heaven. I can walk to you because I've seen something in you, you know. Yeah. So I think yeah. it's about believing in spiritual being. You know? I love that. Basically, it's, and, and I think the flip side of that is I wonder what, Jesus, what it does for you when you approach somebody and then they turn you down. Like, like come and follow me. And the guy is like, eh, let me pass on that. <laughs> I'll pass today, you know, let me pass on that. We don't want rejection. So many times we don't want to ask someone to follow us because I don't want rejection. I mean, somebody might think, who are you? Uh, even me, I know what I'm doing, isn't it? All right. Uh, there was a mic there. Uh -huh. uh, praise God. Amen. So my, my point actually was just on the back of uh, uh, being asked to follow a stranger. It's not something easy. So they might just ask you to give them the, your Twitter account. They follow you on Twitter. <laughs> Uh, 
follow me. Uh, just follow me on Twitter, please. Let me just follow you on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like, who are you? Like, like my father, I know, but who are you? You know, like, like you're a stranger, really, literally, you're a stranger. Uh huh. Suze? Yeah, um, I was just thinking, I think, are these the first disciples that Jesus called? Yeah. Uh, I think we're living in a culture where people will be like, where's your track record? Like, because mm. Jesus is saying, follow me and I will make you become fishes of men. But like, they will tell you, show me those fishes. Like, who, who are the ones you've made, ones before? made before? <laughs> so that I can follow you. What's your track record? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You're asking people to come and you disciple them and they're asking us, show us the ones you've disciples. So we know who they are right now. The ones that, let, show us those fishes of men you've made in the past so that we can trust you. I mean, that's crazy. It's like, yeah, who am I to ask? Anyone ever felt that space of who am I to ask someone else? Who am I to disciple somebody else? I don't know much. Like, they might ask me. One day they might find out I'm an, I'm, like, I'm an imposter. Like, like, they might ask me a question in the Bible, I have no clue. And then they realize, and they ask you, and, and so why are you the one discipling me? I should be the one discipling you. Yeah. Uh, okay, there's one on that side, and then we'll come. I think there was somebody over here, and then there was, I think, one more over there. All right. Oh, let's start with... Oh, the, are you standing up already? Okay, let's stand with him and then we'll come to Pastor Victor. Uh, I think for me, especially if I was Jesus, uh, I know there's so many fishermen over there. Yeah. So what would make me choose you specifically yeah. to actually change the world? Even being come to, by someone being told to just follow them, yeah. what makes me special from the other people yeah. around me? Because so we're also still doing the same work yeah. <laughs> as everyone else. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, I wonder for Jesus, yeah, why these ones? Like, like, sometimes we get paralyzed. So where do I start? Which ones do I start with? What if I start with this ones and I should have started with those other ones? Like, what, what makes me choose this one and not that one? Really powerful, uh-huh. Uh, a, lot, a, a lot is not told about Christ, but I'm just trying to imagine for him to have gone by the lake. Probably before that, he'd been hang, hanging around around the lake for a very, very long time. Yeah. And probably he'd already spotted them. Not having not approached them, but he spotted them and he was like, hey, these guys, I've seen them roll in the waters. They'd be <laughs> good guys if I bring them <laughs> on my side. <laughs> so he said, ah, let me approach them. And the way Pastor uh, Milton put it so well in the morning, you might decide to call someone and they decide to not to be yeah. your other side. So yeah. for me, it's fear of, rejection. fear of rejection. I've seen you, I've called you. But then for you, you're like, no, no, no. Yeah. yeah. I call people to my house, to my DG, and then they're like, why? Kwanzaa, your house is small. <laughs> Kwanzaa, you live where? <laughs> huh? Yeah, fear of rejection. Uh, there was somebody who had said could speak. Who was, who was it? There was, oh, it, it, was it that one? I thought there's somebody. Is there someone I'm ignoring? I think she already is standing. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Um, so we were talking about how you would usually past people when they look busy, right? Like they're doing what they're doing. Yeah. But I think the other deeper cause, the, the, the root thingy for that is maybe just your convictions. Because if I'm convicted enough that what I'm offering you is actually of more profit than what you're actually doing, mm. then I should be able to approach. And even in the midst of your busyness, I should be able to still come at you with the gospel. Because I know what I'm offering you is it, it's for profit, not just the fish that you're fishing to go and sell, but this is for profit and so eternal value. So I think it's also a conviction thing. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, we'll get there just now. Uh, there's one more, I think. Uh -huh. um, other than m most of the things you guys have said, uh, the first one being what we discussed was the fear of rejection. Like people thinking, um, yeah, what's in it for me? Yeah. Like what's your intention? Uh -huh. And especially at this day and age when everything, every, everyone becomes very, like what's in it for me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the one thing we discussed with Sumit is that both of us have started DG uh, in our homes. And we both, it's coincidentally funny because uh, we, I remember last year I started a DG in my house. And uh, we ended up uh, in his house, nobody showed up. <laughs> As in, seriously, yeah. you prepared, yeah. um, you know, it's a Wednesday. You you've set given, up your house. You've called everyone, Snacks. but nobody showed up. So in my house, what happened? Um, we ended up, the nanny, my house manager, and my crew ended up being now the, the, the DG for that day. And it's happened a couple of times. And actually, most of the people that did not show up, they had genuine reasons. One is a mother, the school had a delay and whatnot. So I think practically speaking, it's, yeah. uh, it sounds very easy, but you know, uh, we, 
you know, like you've, you've been there. People, yeah, and come, they didn't come. Follow me, but and they didn't show up. Seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I, I have a funny story about Pastor Victor and Zeddy. <laughs> the first service of their church. Can I tell that story? The first service of their church. I mean, they set up sound, set up church, set up everything. Pastor Victor, who came for that service? Your family and? Oh, I thought there was another person called Kate. My wife and kids, not Kate's. So Pastor Victor was there. His wife showed up. Amen. <laughs> Thank God for his wife. His kids showed up. Praise God for kids. And nobody else showed up. It was their first service. Sound has been set up. Even the worship team didn't show up. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing with you. <laughs> when you told me that story, I just felt pain. But to his credit, he stood up and preached a sermon. Like he preached, like he had a thousand people. Yeah, he preached like he had a thousand people in his church. Yeah, he, he, and that's why, that's why your church is going to have a thousand people. He preached like there were a thousand people. But it's not easy. It's not easy. You call people and then reject you. And I think you guys are sharing some very powerful reasons why it's scary to just approach people. I mean, why would, like, how would you do this? These guys were busy. They were doing something. You know, they were not at sitting idly. You know, it's interesting. God doesn't look for idle people. He's looking for people who are already doing something. Yeah. He's not, he's not looking for the people who are like, this one has nothing to do. He's looking for the people who are already busy. And those are the people he's calling us to go after. People who are already busy. Uh, these guys had their own lives and plans and ambitions, which had nothing to do with what Jesus was calling them to do. Yeah. And imagine, I mean, it's like, how does he do that? This guy is busy. He's a fisherman. He's the top of his craft. He's doing well. He's rolling well. Come on. And then you call him. But you know, that's the way God calls people. He calls people who are already going in a certain direction. True. When I was called to be a pastor, when Pastor Oscar asked me to, give a, to serve in the church for a year and, 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 and be uh, in the discovery program, I mean, that's the last thing that I ever wanted to do. Wow. It was not in my imagination to serve in a church. In fact, some of you know the story. I told him, let me pray about it. I had no intention of praying about it. And the only reason I ended up saying yes is because my girlfriend said yes without asking me. <laughs> yeah. The girlfriend, yeah. And then the girlfriend. Now I had to sign up because I wanted to be with the girlfriend. So I came and told him I prayed about it. But it was a lie. I hadn't prayed. It was, I hadn't prayed. It was a girlfriend. I mean, I was doing something. God isn't looking for people who are just idle. He's looking for people who have their lives. I had ambitions. I had plans. These people, their families depended on them. I mean, Peter was married. Wow. How would he feed his wife? I mean, follow me and then we do what? <laughs> you know, is it that you're giving me a job? There's no job implication there. It's like, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. How much does that pay? More than what I'm making right now. I mean, this was an entire operation. You've just said it, hired servants. They were doing well. But it's interesting because God calls people who already have things that they're doing. They already have ambitions. When I asked Pastor James to be a, a pastor, he told me that he, he was going to be the president. He was not interested. That was not his plan. I mean, he, he, he was on his journey. He was going somewhere. And I asked Pastor CJ to, to come and be uh, on my team. Pastor CJ was like, he was busy going to be a, a, a business mogul. He was going to rule the world and be a serious business. He had no time to do this. But God isn't looking for people who have no plans and ambitions. Yeah, he's looking for people. He's asking us to call people who already have something that they're busy doing. These guys were already comfortable as fishermen. They were not struggling in careers. They had, each family had a boat. In fact, it tells us that Zebedee family had hired hands. So these guys were already upwardly, they were doing something with their lives. They were not just sitting back. None of them had a background in ministry. Somebody said it very well. There were not people who are in ministry. And it's interesting because God isn't necessarily calling us to look for pastors to plant churches and to change the world. Wow. He's, not looking for just, he's, he's not looking for people with theological degrees. It's interesting. We, we, change, we flipped it around, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's like we messed it up because we, nowadays we think it's pastors who are meant to share the gospel. It's pastors who are make, meant to make disciples. It's pastors who are meant to start church. Where did we get that? It's not in the Bible. In fact, Jesus ignored the pastors. Wow, what a shock. The pastors were the Pharisees. They were busy doing pastor things. Jesus didn't go to the pastors. He went to the, to the business people. Wow. He went to the regular people. Tell your neighbor he's talking about you. 
Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, that's the kind of people. It's interesting. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't talk about the fact that, you know, Jesus went to the people of Galilee. Galilee was not necessarily the place where you find pastors. I mean, this was a place where it was not looked at as a sophisticated place. Uh, if you remember, one of Jesus' disciples said, what good can come out of? Nazareth. Yeah, out of Nazareth. What good can come out of that region? But that's where Jesus went. Wow. He's not looking for qualified. God is not looking for qualified people who come from the right families and have the right background. Yeah, he's looking for ordinary people who might be despised by others. Yeah, that's what we're seeing here. These guys had no pedigree. Uh, they didn't come out of a line of rabbis and scholars. They were not prime candidates for a rabbi to call to follow. And Jesus didn't grow up with these guys. They didn't know who he was. They didn't have his background. Uh, they hadn't been with him for 30 years. They were not his boys, the ones he played with growing up. These were people who just came across him. And yet he asked them a very hard thing. He says, come and follow me and I will make you. That's very unusual, very unusual. So let me ask you then, now that you guys have been so imaginative, I think I should be asking questions in the morning. Guys, I saw a lot. This is awesome. I mean, I feel like, I feel like I'm in a place with just amazing, amazing, just the, the, the energy is incredible. Let me ask this. Based on this, why would Jesus have felt so comfortable to ask them such a hard thing? Why would Jesus, knowing all these objections, why do you think he still had no hesitation? And he still felt comfortable to ask them this hard thing. Again, discuss with your very smart neighbor. Uh, again, if you're online, make your list. What do you think are the reasons why... Jesus, knowing all the objections we've listed, still felt comfortable. Still felt comfortable asking these people to be his disciples. Have, let's have that conversation. List it if you're alone. What gave him the guts? <laughs> My, my crew's ready. I can see hands are ready up. People are ready, ready to share. We have somebody with a mic on each side. All right, let's hear some, some feedback. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, morning, church. Morning. Uh, we have been discussing this, and we feel that Jesus knew that was in tune with the heart and mind of the Father. And therefore, he could not choose anybody else. He knew these are the right ones. Wow. Out of all that crowd, because he was in tune with the heart and mind of the Father, yeah. he knew exactly whom to go for. He was praying. He was praying. And he was, he was conscious, spiritual. God had really been showing him things. Yes. Wow. Isn't that powerful? Yeah. He was in prayer, and God was already showing him stuff. Uh huh. More, Pastor Mike. One, two. All right. Uh, for me, I believe it's because Jesus... Jesus had the confidence because he knew what he was offering them was of eternal value Come on. than what they were doing at that particular moment. Oh, wow. Wow. So powerful. So powerful. There's something he had for them that was bigger. Even though they were busy, even though they were doing something really important, what he had to offer them was more important. Okay, somebody on this side. There's a microphone already. If you have it, just speak here. Yeah. I, I have it. Um, I, I think... The fact that they had not caught any fish, that shows a characteristic that they are very patient. <laughs> Building a church like Pastor Victor <laughs> had his wife and children. <laughs> he preached to them, but he still waited. Wow. So Jesus saw that these are very patient people. To build a movement, Come Pastor on. M, I mean, yeah. look at this. And the Lord said, cast your net on the other side. Yeah. And they caught the fish. Wow. And I can wow. also imagine not many people like to fish because it's scary to go into those waters, right? Yeah. So it's scary to go and plant a church. 
it's scary to be out there. And so I love Jesus it. saw those characteristics of fishermen. Jesus is seeing what other people are not seeing, isn't it? And maybe you sometimes think you're disqualified because of the profession you have, because of the background you have. And that very thing is what makes you qualified for Jesus to use. Somebody might be saying, I don't have a father. I don't know how to relate with a father. And maybe that's the very thing because Jesus knows that this world has many people without fathers. Wow. And that they may not listen to people who have good fathers telling them about fathers. They need somebody like you to say, I had no father, but I found a father. So can you. Yeah? The very thing you think disqualified you becomes the very thing that God says, this is the person that I'm going to use. Tell somebody, he's talking about you. Yeah, this is it. You're the right person. I love that. All right, let's come back. Uh, okay, somebody has a mic at the back. Thank you. Um, they represented the demographic. Can we trade voices? <laughs> yes, let's trade. <laughs> they represented the demographic that he wanted to reach. Mm. He saw them beyond their imperfections. He, he saw them beyond their challenges. Yeah. And he knew that he could work with what they had. Wow. wow. I love that. You know, it's very interesting for us to look at what is on the surface. You look at this person, they're disorganized, they're not with their wife, they are, they are just uh, lazy, they, 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 uh, they don't keep their word, they don't come on time, and you write them off without seeing what is inside. But you know what? Uh, Jesus had eyes to see not just what the person was, but to see what the person could become. And I believe that we must develop those eyes, not to see people on the surface. You're looking at this person and everybody's writing them off because of how they're dressed, because of how they look. But you have no clue that when you look a bit deeper, when you ask God to show you, like was said earlier, you will see something that anybody else is ignoring. And people will look at you later and say, how did you see this thing that nobody else saw? And yet, you know, it's interesting because some people think you have to start with a really good team to do well. So if I'm starting with a discipleship group, I have to look for the guys who are stars because I want to build a, a winning team. That's not how Jesus starts. He actually looks for potential. He looks for what other people are not seeing. And those are the people he raises up and makes them giants. Amen. Those of you who are football, football fans, you know that there are teams that are good at hiring stars. And then there are teams that are good at making stars. Jesus says, come and follow me and I will make you. God wants you to be a maker of stars. All right, someone standing on this side. Okay. Uh, the most striking thing about this is that for the first time now we see the word network come in. Mm. This is how it comes about. He tells them to cast their nets. In, on, in it, originally, the nets were not working. So, so which network is that? <laughs> so, as I finish, as I finish, these are guys who are busy, but apparently they are two by two. You see, Peter and Andrew, yeah. James, and so. Even Jesus sending us, even in our time, two by two, this is where it started. Wow. Because you don't fish alone. Come on. Even hey. when it comes to evangelism, wow. you don't do it alone. So good. And among you, the nets were not working. So he tells them, cast in the deep. And what will happen? Network the nets works. started working. Network. <laughs> Amen. Which network is that person part of? <laughs> what, have you, what have you guys done to Pastor John? <laughs> Oh my gosh. This is Pastor Kilonzi's influence. Wow. I'll never forget that. The network came about. The net started working. I love that. But you know, I love the downtown. I, I love that. There's a sense of humor, but it brings out some powerful truth there. Because you don't do it alone. You need your network. Uh, this individualism cannot help us. You cannot be a ninja Christian. Just going around by yourself. You know, just going around by yourself making disciples. You can't do that. We do it together. This thing is done with a family. So thank you so much, uh, Pastor John. Uh, there was somebody else with a mic somewhere? Okay. Yeah. By the way, it's the guys of the mics. You should be putting your hands to see you. Because me, I can't, I, I don't have the mic. Uh-huh. So, um, uh, so for me, I think one of the things that was really striking was these guys were just used to dealing with uh, the people who probably had buy the fish and distribute the fish. Yeah. So when Jesus comes, he's introducing them into a new sphere of influence. 
So he knows that it'll intrigue them and it'll have a pull on them that they'll not only be dealing with, you know, these, these arguments of how much, how much, you know, like they're pushing them. I mean, he's pulling them out of that space wow. and then pushing them into a space where it's about influence, it's about relationships, it's about growth. Come on. So that's very, very enticing Come on. for them. Come on. Man, are you, are you seeing some imagination here? Yeah, this is awesome. I love the sanctified imagination. When you become a disciple maker, what are you doing? You're introducing people to different networks, including to a network with their Heavenly Father. And those are different networks from what they're used to. All right, I can see she handed the mic to her neighbor, which was illegal, but because uh, just, just, you're standing, I'll let you, and then we'll come back here. Um, first of all, evangelism is a smelly affair, and so is fishing. <laughs> so I think it was... <laughs> <laughs> This is Pastor John's fault. <laughs> <laughs> and not only that, these guys were actually very teachable because I felt, I feel if Jesus had gone for the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the likes, uh, yeah. there would be what we call oh, in Greek, so kemenyi, you know, <laughs> know it all. So there's no way they would have followed Jesus. So I think these people were the perfect ones wow. to actually do this kind of ministry. That is so deep, so, so good. When you're looking for disciples, you're not necessarily looking for the most qualified or the least qualified. You're looking for the most teachable. Yeah, yeah Jesus looked for teachable people because he knew there are some people who are not teachable in Israel. All right? By the way, I hope you guys are taking notes. The message already started. Eh? This, we're preaching today. We're all preaching to one another. All right. Come on, Ashuka. Okay. Um, I feel Jesus was very confident to call out these people because he knew his call. Mm. When he was baptized, he, uh, God said, this is my son, yeah. whom I'm well pleased Come on, with. Somebody. So that gave him the confidence to just go. Even if there was so much rejection, so much persecution, he was like, I know my father. Yeah. I am a son. I know what we are doing. Yeah. And just that affirmation makes you go. Absolutely. So even when, when people don't show up, I, I feel Pastor Victor, yeah. we did the same thing. One person showed up. Come on. You had we one person, again. amen. One person showed up, wow. someone who even just came to visit. A different person had. the next time. They were not even a congregant. Wow. They were from another church. And still, that you continue because you know who sent you. Wow. He's not the same person Oof. who is there. So good. So, so good, guys. Guys, I think this, this is wisdom. You know, it's interesting because... Oh, okay. I can, oh, sorry. There's one, two, three. Okay, and four. All right, all right. Huh? You have a mic. Are you holding a mic? If you're not holding a mic, you're, you're not in the counts. But make sure the guys with the mic, there are people at the back I think you're ignoring. All right. Yes, so um, I think Jesus saw a seed of sonship with uh, James and John because these two are working with their father. Oof. And actually, and, and, and we are told they were teenagers. So in fact, they were serving their father. So they, they saw a seed of sonship and that teachable spirit that someone talked about. Come on. So, Looking yeah. for, yeah. You're making sons. I love it. Uh, who was the next one? Who had a mic here already? Don't hand it to your neighbor. <laughs> so, um, you know, the scripture says that the zeal of the house of the Lord consumes me yeah. concerning Jesus. Yeah. So I feel that the zeal for the kingdom of God is so consuming for him. So um, he was up to establishing the kingdom of God against every other kingdom. At so any he cost. Would do it whichever way, yeah. and establish the kingdom of God. Come on. He wanted, I mean, it's like, even if they reject me, I have a mission. I'm representing the kingdom of God. I will do it anyway. I love that. By the way, Yemi is our worship pastor today. Did he do a great job? He led, he led amazingly in worship. And here's the great thing. I mean, we're going to Nigeria, and Yemi runs a kitchen, a Nigerian kitchen. So he's actually coming with us as our caterer. Come on, guys. Like, nowadays, that's how we roll. We roll with our own caterer. Like, uh, so, so I'm so, so excited because uh, he's our chef and caterer. And the beautiful thing is, you know, Nigerian food, it takes a bit of getting used to. No offense, Pastor Sai. So, so he'll modify it with some East African. He will reduce the pepe a bit. And so I'm so excited. Come on, let's appreciate Pastor Yemi. He's a great guy. All right. Why are you in my list? Oh, you've rigged yourself in. All right, just speak. <laughs> These children, they're so violent. Okay. Praise God. Amen. Yeah, I'm Monica from Uganda. Oh, come on. <laughs> then you have to speak. You have to speak. Uh, to me, what I've learned in that scripture, mm. uh, it was 
Jesus is responsible to look for those fishermen yeah. so that they can fish solos because no one will be asked about the job or whatever he or she was doing in this universe when we go back to our Heavenly Father. Come on. We will be asked about how many souls did we fish. That's Monica from Uganda. Thank you, Monica. <laughs> Amen. There's wisdom. Um, we saw that uh, Jesus understood the assignment. He was a true follower. So he followed, he was told, go do this, and he followed. Because the vision was very clear. Yeah. And that was what gave him the conviction. And the fact that when he saw the world, the world was in a crisis. Yeah. So that gave him the conviction to think, I'm doing this, and I've been sent, the vision is clear. I love so it. he understood the assignment. It's, I love that. It's so easy to see people doing well, and you're thinking, but these ones are too busy, or they're doing too well, and not understand, no, the world is in a crisis. A lot of the wealth and the success hides brokenness. Some of the most successful looking people are some of the most desperate looking, uh, desperate people on the inside. And they need what you have. Wow. You have to be convinced they need what you have. And that's absolutely true. He knew his mission and he knew these people are broken. They need what I have. All right. I think there was somebody over here. Yeah. So for me is because Jesus is Jesus. I mean, if it was not him, who could have done it? Then since he's Jesus, he doesn't have the limitations we have like imposter syndrome and presentation <laughs> of how he looks yeah. or things like that. Then the other thing, there's something that when, if you speak with power and authority, there's something that does, that does to people. Mm. So him, he spoke with power and authority. So even if the, the fishermen were to question, hey, uh, why have we followed this guy? They would have done that later, because that's what we do. If you're given instructions and then the person presents themselves with power and authority, you'll just find yourself doing. I love it. Then you question later after you've already it. started doing. So good. I love uh, why I love what you said. In fact, I think like you almost contradicted yourself because you first said it's because it was Jesus. Only Jesus can do that. Yeah. And then you said, but we can do it if we have power and authority. Yes. <laughs> you notice what you just did. And, and we can because we have power and authority. The same power that Jesus had that raised Christ from the dead is the same power that lives in me. And Jesus says, you will do greater things than what you've seen me do because I'm going to the Father. That's what he expects of us. So if Jesus could do it, so can we. Exactly. I love that. Uh-huh. Uh, so Come on, Martin. Okay, this is on a light note, but <laughs> as a man, as in, you're used to hearing no, so what's another no? <laughs> 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 so this one is saying the, the boy child is disadvantaged. He's always being told no, so what's another no? We're used to rolling with it as boy child. Maybe it's a bit easier for men to take rejection. I don't know about that, by the way. I don't know about that. I'm not sure about that. All right. Uh, I think there was one last person right at the back uh, who was so, so, like, really, really wanted to beat the gate down. And then uh, you'll allow me. I'll ask other questions, so don't worry. We'll, we'll still have an interaction. There was just one person who really shouted. Yes. I, yeah, I, I that wanted, was you. I wanted yeah. to say that if Jesus really wanted disciples, there were the ready-made ones for John. He'd have used John. They were John's disciples. They were his cousin's disciples. I mean, he would have used them. But here is the problem. When you are in the business of taking people's disciples, they don't respect you because you didn't make them. Come on. Yeah? So ask me. I'm a church planter. <laughs> <laughs> You've learned the hard I way. <laughs> know, I know how to plant the next church with disciples that I have made because the ones that I went with and were made left me. Hello, wow. good morning. <laughs> yeah, so make your own disciples. Jesus was so bright. Come on, somebody. Are you hearing, are you hearing some wisdom in the house? So, so guys, I mean, what we're learning is the wisdom of Jesus. Why would you be so bold, so confident to talk to people who could reject you for any reason, any one of the reasons we listed? We've talked about some of those things. Jesus uh, had prayed. He had come from his fast. God had showed him. And so he walked. How many people are fasting, by the way? How many people are fasting? Let me just see, 21 day fast. Yeah. Have you been in, in a time of prayer? Then you need to trust your father has heard your prayer and he's going to lead you. Yeah. You've asked for God to guide you. This year, God will guide you. It's not an if. You've already been in front of him. Now you take it with the assumption, my father has heard me and he will do it. He will show me where to go and he will open the door for me before I get there. 
Uh, Jesus uh, had, had already, I mean, he, he came to them because he knew that what he had was more important than anything they have. By the way, when I discovered this one thing, it changed my life. I used to think that, I mean, I used to be so intimidated by people until I began to understand salvation is not a spiritual thing. Because spiritual is just one part of who I am. Salvation is an all of life thing. When I get saved, what happens? I become connected and plugged into the reason I was created. Before I know my father, when I'm living away in the pigs like the prodigal son, guess what's happening? At that point, I have cut myself away from my purpose. I might be partying, I might be having the lifestyle, I might have money and wealth, but those things are nothing. It's interesting, I was having a conversation with uh, Jackie this morning, and she said when she had her near-death near experience, remember Jackie who had a near-death experience, and her spirit left her body, and she looked down, and she could see herself? She said when she came back, she said, wealth stopped being important to me. Because at that point, none of her wealth came up with her. <laughs> All the tunes were going to be left for her children to figure out what to do with. It was not going to be important where she was going. When you have an experience like that, it means that God opens your eyes to the, the fact that all this is just stuff for here. Wow. When I see somebody who's rich and driving their big car and living in their big mansion, I don't feel, oh my God, look at them. I feel like, oh my goodness, they need God. Wow. And without God, all this is rubbish. It is nothing. It's rubble. It's going to be burnt. You're going to, be, you're going to leave it. In fact, some of it might even destroy your children's life because they don't know how to make it themselves. You've cursed them. How many people do we know like that? And where they went, the money did not go with them. It did not go with them. When I look at them, I feel sorry. There's a story that, I, I can't remember what the name was, but I remember one, there's a, there's a pyramid they found of a, a tomb where it was, written a, it, it was written the name of a great king. And it says, here lies, and I can't remember what his name was, the greatest king who ever lived. Look upon this name and tremble. And when the people came and they unearthed the tomb, they were like, and who was this guy? Like nobody had ever heard of him. Like in his time, he was the greatest king who ever lived. People looked at him and they trembled. They heard his name and they trembled. Today, nobody refers to him. Nobody refers to him. Somebody once said very powerfully, they said uh, in, the, in the time that Jesus lived, the name Caesar was a name that made everybody tremble. Everybody trembled at that name. Everybody in the world trembled at the name of Caesar. Nobody knew a name like Peter, John, James. Who are those? Today, we name our children Peter, James, John, and we name our dogs Caesar. Yeah. Those things that those people are living for are nothing. Nothing. They will not be remembered. And salads. Yeah. I mean, it's sad when you think about it because this was the most feared man of his time. Today, nobody cares. Nobody cares. So when I see those people with all their money, I don't feel, oh my God, look at how rich they are. Look at how happy they are. I feel, oh my God, they need you. They will die. This wealth is actually blinding them to their real reality. And that gives you the confidence to say, follow me. Because I can make you. <laughs> yes, you're a rich businessman. Yes, you're in your father's business. Yes, you have many boats. Follow me and I will make you what you are created to be. Because what you're doing right now is not what you are made for. You are made for more. You're made for more. Jesus knew there was something that they needed. And he knew that the thing they needed is what he had. That's the other thing, isn't it? He knew that what they needed is what he had. Do you have it? Do you have eternal life? Yep. Are you a daughter or a son? Some of you are not sounding sure. I need to do an altar call. <laughs> are you a son of the Most High, a daughter of the Most High? Yes. Do you have a relationship with the Most High, the King of the universe? Yes. Are you a prince and a princess, a royalty, royal priesthood? Are you one of those? Yes. Yeah. So you have what they need. Wow. What they need is what you have. When you have that, when you know that, then you can approach them and not be intimidated. In fact, if, if they say no, remember the rich young ruler? The Bible says he said no because he, was too, he had too many possessions. And he says Jesus was very sad. Jesus was saddened. He looked at him sadly as he walked away. And he said how, how difficult it is for rich people to enter the kingdom of God. Like his heart was broken. 
He wasn't like, oh my goodness, that would have been a good contribution to our kitty. That girl would have brought tithes. He didn't think like that. He was like, I'm so sad for this guy because he's gained the whole world and he's lost his soul. So Jesus knew this is what he wanted to do. And what I would have been extremely hesitant to do back in the day, today, I don't have any hesitation. Saying to my disciples, follow me and I will make you. I said to Pastor James, follow me and I'll make you. Yeah. I'll make you everything God wants you to be. Not because I'm eight, but because as I follow Jesus and you follow me, you will become. Come on. It's just the way it is. So nowadays, I'm not afraid to do it. I used to be afraid, but nowadays I say, if you follow me, something will change in your life. Wow. Why am I so confident of that? Because I know who I'm following. Come on. Yeah. Do you know who you're following? Ask your neighbor, do you know who you're following? Yeah. 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 Exactly. So Jesus knew two things about himself. Jesus knew his identity and he knew his authority. His identity and his authority. Jesus knew those two things about himself. Matthew chapter 3 verse 7, a voice from heaven said, this is my son, somebody quoted that, whom I love, with whom I'm well pleased. Jesus knew he was the son of God. He was royal. He was priesthood. He knew that what he had is what the world needed. He was confident in the fact that God loved him. God approved of him, that he didn't need the approval of human beings. That if somebody rejected him, it was not a rejection. It was actually a rejection of God. And so he was not afraid to ask. He didn't have to impress anyone as long as he was on God's assignment. Ask your neighbor, do you know your identity? And by the way, that's a very serious question. Because if you don't know your identity, you'll be shaken many times. You'll be so afraid of asking people to be your disciples. You'll be so afraid of leading people because you don't know who you are. You know that song we sing? I know who I am. I know who I am. I know who I am. I am yours. I am yours. And you are mine. By the way, some of these songs, we sing them in church like it's just something to say. You need to understand what you're singing. Do you really know who you are? Because if you know who you are, you will not act like somebody with their tail between their legs. Yeah. You, you, like a Caesar with their tail between their legs. Yeah. You'll be confident in who you are. You'll be bold in the asks that you make. You will not fear rejection. Yes, they may reject, but it's not you they're rejecting. They're rejecting God. And Jesus says, woe unto those who reject me. It will be worse for them on the day of judgment than it was for the city of Sodom that was burnt up. Wow. He knew it wasn't him they had rejected. It was God they had rejected. And oh my goodness, I'm so sorry for them because they have no clue that they're rejecting life itself. Wow. So when you come to people with, 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 uh, with, with an offer to disciple them, with an offer to lead them, and they don't show up, do what Pastor Victor did. Preach the next Sunday. Okay. How many people showed up the next Sunday? Four. Come on. Wow. The church had grown by 400%. <laughs> Fastest growing church in Nairobi. And then the next Sunday, there were still four. But he knew who he was. Oh, it was for the family. Or oh, not even new people. But you knew who you are. And you preached like you're preaching to a thousand. By the way, it's his wife who told me he preached like he was preaching to a thousand people. He fed the ones God had brought in front of him. Because he, it wasn't about him, you see. It wasn't about, what, it, it wasn't about him. It was about the people that God had given him. The one person who shows up for your discipleship group, your, your house help. That's the person you preach to that day. Because that's the one God has given you. You don't feel rejected. You're like, look, they've rejected God, but it's okay. There's a message here that has to be preached. And the ones who are here are the ones who get it. And you know what? You know that eventually others will come. Like Jesus didn't need, a, he didn't need the crowds. He knew that if I get these ones, others will come. Yeah, others will come. When I look at this hall and I see empty seats, I'm not discouraged. I know a time will come when there will be thousands upon thousands upon thousands in a gathering. And people will be making reservations because there will be a time when it just closes and we say, you can't come anymore. We don't have any more space. It will happen. But I'm encouraged when I see the ones God has brought today. The ones who are getting it. So don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. <laughs> Many church planters, I know, myself included, the, the day you plant a church and you find that the, the worship team, I remember at Nairobi Chapel when we started, that the worship team was more than the congregation. Wow. 
So we would actually come for practice rehearsal. We start, we're there like uh, the, 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 the eight people in the church, we're in the worship team. Then when the church comes, starts, we're like, okay, see four of you guys go and be the congregation so that the rest of us can lead you. Yeah. <laughs> you guys can be the backups from the, from, from the front, you know. It's like, yeah, that's it. Look at what Nairobi Chapel is today. It's hundreds upon hundreds and upon hundreds of churches. Yeah, so don't be afraid. That thing you're starting in your sitting room could actually one day become a life-changing movement that will change the world, will be across all nations. That's not up to you. Let your father do it. You do your responsibility because you know your identity. You know who you are. Jesus knew his identity. Number two, Jesus knew his authority. He knew his authority. John 5, 19, Jesus gave them this answer. Very tr truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing because whatever the father does, the son also does. I love that. That's exactly what Bolivar mentioned earlier. He, has, he knows his authority. He knows that what I'm doing is because I've seen my father doing it already. Uh, and so I can do it with boldness because God himself is doing it. I know I'm in my father's business. I know I'm representing kingdom of heaven. So I don't have to be shy to ask people, do you want to get saved? Why? Even if they refuse, it's okay because I'm representing the kingdom of heaven. The agenda I'm representing is the agenda God wants represented. I'm not here to please men or to make people feel good about myself. I'm here to do what my father wants. This is the thing that Jesus had. He had the authority of the son. He was confident because he knew whatever he was doing was what God wanted him to do. You know, it's interesting because I, I, I'm, I'm so confident that nobody will come to this gathering and go back poor because they were not working this week. Yeah. I'm so confident. You are, you are on your father's business. You have closed your business. You're not advertising this week. You're not out there hustling. You have chosen to close it down and be here. You will not be poor because of that. Yeah. You're representing your father in heaven. You're doing what he's called you to do. He's called you to be a disciple. You're in a place that's making you a disciple. Let heaven deal with you. Let the authority of heaven back you up. When you represent as an ambassador, you don't worry about who's going to pay the school fees for your children. Yeah. When they call you to go to Japan and be the ambassador for Kenya. <laughs> yeah. Some people say, they, somebody say, amen. Uh -huh. ah, yeah. I receive. <laughs> when they call you, by the way, yeah, you are not going to be worrying about, but what about my kids? Uh, but, but, but what if they don't like the, what if we can't afford a good school? What about food? Who will be feeding us? What is the cost of fuel in Japan? <laughs> that is the least of your worries. If the government sends you, the government will feed you. Yeah. That's why Jesus says, look, look at the lilies in the field. Look at how finely dressed they are. Why are you worrying about clothes? You do God's will. Seek his kingdom. Understand that you're representing another nation. And this leads me to my questions. And I want to ask two questions. And this one's I want us to have our final discussion. Do you know the graces in the life that God has given you? Yeah, Jesus knew what he had. He knew the things that he was calling people into. Do you know that thing that is in you that is so valuable that everybody needs it desperately do you know the grace that god has given you when you tell people come and follow me pastor baji when you call your young people and say come follow me what are you telling them to follow you for do you know what will change in their life when they follow you are you confident in that thing do you know the graces in your life that god has given you have you seen them and called out these graces in the life of the people that you're leading if you're a discipleship group leader what graces has god given you that are going to come they're going to come upon these people because inheritance happens yeah, it's not sought. What is it that you have? Do you know what you have? Ask your neighbor, do you know what you have? Yeah, because yeah, you, might, you might not know. You might not have any idea. Do you ever watch those superhero films when somebody gets like a superhero gift but they don't know? And so they need someone to coach them because it's like, just because they don't even know they have it. And they're, they're like, they're walking around like a bomb because somebody who doesn't know what they have is a dangerous person. Yeah, somebody has to actually pull it out of you and say, by the way, you need to understand you have this thing. Yep. You have this thing. Do you know what it is that you have? What is the grace in your life? Wow. And do you call it out boldly in your children? You know, one of the things I always say is, if you're part of Mavuno Church and you are following, <laughs> you will have a good marriage. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. 
you cannot both be here following or you cannot be here following and then your marriage is not in that space. Things will change. Just follow. What Pastor Kelonzi said yesterday was true. I told him and faith, just follow us. And I said, the graces will fall upon you. And faith has actually come and told me there's something that changed in our marriage. Haven't you told me that, Pastor Faith? There's something that changed in our marriage. Just by hanging around you, something has changed. Something is happening. That's your grace, people. It's your grace. But you have to follow. Do you know the grace? Are there some things you're saying, my goodness, when these people come, this is going to change. I know it's going to change because that's who I am. That's who God has made me to be. Maggie, when they finally come, I know they're going to change. Because you can't be in my sitting room day in, day out, and your life remains the same after a year. Yeah, I know. You're a gifted woman. God has already called you. They can't. They have to change. You know when you know this, then you don't feel devastated when you don't come. You feel sorry for them and you're like, guys, you can't miss next week. Wow. Yeah, you can't miss because I know what you're missing out. Wow. I don't feel like you've... Actually, it's not me who has lost. It's you who has lost. So I tell them, come next week because I don't want you to miss. We had a fantastic time with the people who came. Okay, they don't know that the people who came is your child and your house help. But the ones who came were blessed. Yeah. So don't miss next time. <laughs> don't miss next time. Do you know the graces in your life? Number two, are you aware of or actively seeking the graces of God in your discipler? Wow. There's something very powerful that Pastor Kelonzi said yesterday. He said that the person who is your discipleship group leader, the grace they have is the grace they've received from your campus pastor. And that grace, that campus pastor received it from your network pastor. And that grace they received from Pastor Kara and myself. Yeah. And that's the grace that God gave to this church. Wow. Wow. And so when you align to the discipler, when you go to Pastor CJ's discipleship group, you need to be able to understand there's something in this church that I'm tapping in, and this is the person. I'm calling this gift out because it's a gift that is for me. Wow. Yeah, wow. it's a gift that's for me. Wow. So are you aware, actively seeking the graces of God in your discipler, the graces of God in this house, have you chosen to make them your own? Have you said to yourself, these are not Pastor M's things, these are my things. These are the graces of God in our church. These are the things that are true of me. They may not be evident right now, but they are going to be because that's my inheritance. And have you owned those things as your in inheritance? Are you following hard? I want us to have a bit of a conversation about that. We've gone a bit deeper now. Let's get into that space of, come on, do you understand what you're calling people into? And then number two, have you accepted those graces and made them your own? Let's have that conversation with the people we're discussing now. We're getting a bit more personal now. We're moving from the disciples to ourselves. Uh, if you're online, again, have this conversation. It's the last conversation we'll have in this session. It's just like, yeah, let's talk about it. Are you calling those things out? Are you bold like Jesus? If you've been afraid, it's okay to say, I've been afraid, but from now on, I'm going to be different. So that's okay. Maybe your pastor asked you to lead a discipleship group and you said, but I can't. They would never listen to me. But today you're saying, I understand. Something is different. Something is different. Just be as honest as possible. Keep it real. We've moved out of the disciples. Now we are on me and where I am. If you're watching this alone, again, take your list and just write it out. If you're listening to it on a podcast, take your list and just write it out. 
What are those things, the graces God has called you to? What are the graces that God has given to your disciple, to your church? Have you owned them? Which ones have you owned? Which ones are you struggling to own? What can you do to position yourself better as a son in that house? And how do you begin to become a parent now to bless other people, to call other people to follow Jesus? Make sure someone else is sharing. Don't take all the time. I'll give us just a couple more minutes. Hopefully we're moving to the last person by now. get some some feedback I've got people with microphones already do you have our microphones okay so there's someone on this side okay there's some someone over there at the back there's other hands at the back okay all right there are people behind you over there in the middle okay All right, we'll carry this conversation on in a bit. So just summarize, the person who's talking right now, just summarize. All right. Okay, we've got people with the mics. Let's just hear some feedback. Uh, let's start over here. Tell your neighbor, shh. <laughs> All right, let's go. Let's hear just a couple of people. Um, number one, it's a bit of a hit and miss, the graces that I know God has, for, has given me, from my talents to speaking to people. But the flip, of, the flip side is when I'm in MK and when I'm with my kids in the children's home, that compulsion to call out the gifts that they have and show them that they can be much more. Yeah. It helps me even understand the graces that God has given me. Like, that is also a grace, to yeah. just be there and call it, calling it out. Yeah. And being their discipler, their, their teacher, their pastor, the person who affirms them, their counselor, those are the graces that I get to understand. You have a passion. You're exactly. great with children. Yeah. yeah. That is something I get to understand. And you're an amazing father, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
And number two. So active. anyone who follows you, that's a grace that they're going to receive. Amen. Yeah. I receive. Yeah. Number two, actively seeking the graces of God for my disciple. I think I have shared this before. And it's been an amazing experience being under the discipleship of one Frederick Muteti. I have learned so much yeah. from him and the graces that God has given him in terms of going to the nations, speaking to several world leaders. Those uh, have followed him throughout last year and this year yeah. to the point that I received phone calls from ambassadors Come on. requesting, asking if we can do certain projects for them, structure financial uh, projects for them. Th that is something I never thought I would. Fred, and it Fred is, is a member of, he's one of the DG leaders at yes. Mavuno Lifeway. Yes. And he's, he's his leader. Yeah. yeah. Going, as it, it's, it's been, and I'm taking now even the experiences that he has given me and going out to the nations. That is an inheritance I've gotten from him. Come on. And following hard. I love and it. And I know there is so much more to come because he has given me that inheritance as my spiritual father and an authority. And that is something Pastor Godin always tells us. I've given you the nations. And he also calls it out from us, go to the nations. Yeah. He affirms, he affirms um, Fred, and Fred affirms me that this is your portion. Come on. When you walk with me, this is what you're going to get. That's really powerful. And I'm living yeah. proof that it works. Yeah. It happens when you follow hard. And it's something also that Pastor Emma has told us, that when you're, when you're there with, um, he calls out global influence. And I'm having, go, I'm having that global influence. And you're having people from different countries calling you for solutions in Zambia, in Zimbabwe. And that is something I never thought I would do. But now I, I'm an expert even in hydrogen. And I, I don't <laughs> have a degree or anything. But wow. ask me about hydrogen, I can tell you about how we can have solar panels and then have electrolyzers and then we have hydrogen power. Wow. There are levels. So remember, discipleship is sharing all of life, isn't it? And uh, Fred is a global leader. He's part of Mavuno Lifeway. Pastor Godwin has called out of, out of him. He's called out of Bob. And it's working. It's working. It's working. Yeah, somebody's standing over here. Hello, church. Hi. My name is Aban Omtoto. Come on, Avan. <laughs> One. Thank you, thank you. One. Do you know the graces in your life that God has given you? Uh, from Pastor M's teaching yesterday and today, I've learned that uh, my father and I had to go close. The closeness between us was broken a long time ago, but I have inherited his leadership skills and authoritativeness. Wow amongst other things that make uh, our relationship broken. <laughs> now, <laughs> number two, are you aware or actively seeking the graces of God in your discipler? So the thing is, my friends, they admire and also envy me at the same time. And they tell it to me openly. Like, dude, you're great. You do things that literally they are beyond you. Uh, beyond your age, even uh, beyond your skill. And uh, mostly, I invite my friends to my spaces. For example, come to Mavuno Church. Let's go to, probably, I do art. So I tell them, let's go to an art exhibition. Uh, you see uh, what I do and what I involve myself in. So most of them give me excuses. And uh, for sometimes, I used to be mad at them and uh, uh, because uh, they t it was like that not being real or being serious about the admiration or envy that they had over me. <laughs> <laughs> but I came to understand one thing, that there's something called timing. Everyone has his or her own timing. So even if you try as, as much as to push somebody to the limit, but it's not yet their time, they won't move. Even personally, that has happened to me. Uh, Pastor Mugambi, Pastor... Pastor Kilonzi, I remember Pastor, uh, Pastor Winston from Uganda, he left, he was here. Yeah. When I was in college, they used to speak great things over me. But at, at that time, I couldn't believe it. But right now, I'm at a space where the, 
I am doing things that they told me, uh, for example, Pastor Kilonzi ins uh, insisted that I should do Fearless Institute. I didn't see myself doing it. But right now, I am believing it that I am doing it. Come yeah. Come on. So the timing, probably it is not the right time, but just give people time and they will bloom regardless. As long as they want to, they will, they will bloom. I love that. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, that's good. I love that you ended with as long as they want to. Because they do have to choose to follow, isn't it? And you chose to follow, and that's a great thing. I love it. All right, there was somebody on that side, yeah, standing up already. Right. Um, from the previous question, um, I wanted actually to get up and say that Jesus had an identity and so he had authority. Um, and then, ironically, that's what we spoke about. Because if you do not know who you are, then you do not even have the power to actually speak. And so for me, that is what I've seen um, from this home, from Hill City. Pastor James will actually give you an identity and call you a son. As much as he won't say son, he'll be like, I trust you. <laughs> you know, he'll be like, I have confidence in you. And so that already now for me brought me to actually say, okay, fine. I have an identity in the house. And so for that identity, I'm able to actually have authority that is there. Wow. Then what graces do I have? Pastor James would say that I have the graces to actually be able to call out people and get them to lead. And for me, at first I was like, eh, he's probably saying that to motivate me. But what really actually happened is that I got to see myself lead a team that now I actually do not involve myself. Like the production team is actually the one that now produces itself. That I am able to even step away and they still run everything. So for, pe for me, that's something that I got to see. And so it's that calling out something that is within someone and allowing them to actually grow into what it's supposed to be. I love it. Come on, my friend. Hey! Come. Uh, uh. I hope you heard what he said just now. Okay, he heard. I love it. All right. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi. My name is Valerie, and <laughs> uh, I'm just so grateful for being in this space. Uh, first of all, one thing I've learned from Pastor Dorcas and Pastor James is uh, <laughs> the power to speak life. Mm. Speak life over your children, and I really admire their marriage. Yeah. And just the, the fact that you have said being in this space, the grace that my pastor has will flow down to what I have. Yeah. I really admire them, the way they hold hands. I, I, <laughs> yes. And just the fact that we were able to go through Ndoa with my lovely husband, Dan Stan. Come on. I, 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 I thank God for the space that Mavuno has given us as a family that we came in. I started as a volunteer at uh, Mavuno Kids, then my husband joined me as the security dad. And right now our kids are in the worship team. It oh, is wow. good to be in, this, in that space and know that I'm looking up to Pastor Dockers and Pastor James and all that they do and how they treat their kids and how they have raised their kids. Amen. Yeah. Amen. 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 And the graces in this house are your graces as a couple, in Jesus' name. All right, so there's somebody standing already. There's, yes. there's two people, okay. okay. Hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> My name is Lois from Avuno Kiambu. Come on, Lois. <laughs> Woo! I, I want it. to share two things. Uh, one is uh, about my neighbor. I feel like she said something so powerful that you guys should hear, and I'm so grateful that she's my friend, and I want to tap to that grace. So she told me she has a grace for wisdom. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that uh, God shows her what to do and tells her uh, what is expected of her and shows her the end from the beginning. And that is so true because yesterday I went to her house and we had a conversation and whatever I shared, she, was just, she just confirmed and told me that God has just uh, like um, shortened that whole process for her. Like she never learns from consequences. She gets to hear God 
and she hey. gets to learn from that. Wisdom. And I'm thinking, I really want to tap uh, onto that grace. So I thought that was so cool, mercy. And oh, then <laughs> the next thing I want to share is a grace that my pastor carries, Pastor Maish. Come on, Pastor Maish. <laughs> Uh, all of you that know Pastor Maish know that he carries a grace of excellence. Yeah. Pastor Maish keeps saying, um, if you do it on time, you're late. So you have to do it early. So last year, I never really used to get what he means. Just thought, hi, Pasi. Sinimefika 802. I am early. <laughs> but then he, he kept saying that, but I didn't really get it. But at some point, I think I caught it. I caught what he says. And I began to see that translate even in my own work when I was doing Fearless Institute. And I realized my boss said the same thing. Oh, you are actually uh, leveling up and you're becoming excellent. Wow. So I think I picked that from Pastor Maish and I'm grateful for that. Thank come you. Come on, come on, Pastor Maish. Thank you, Lois. We've got somebody standing at the back there. Hi. Hi. How are you? Fine, <laughs> thank you. My name is Onjiko. Um, from Mabuno Hill City. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so my partner here said that they know the graces they have through people who, uh, you know, brought this up. Because uh, sometimes some of us struggle to identify the grace that we have on our lives. Uh, personally, I know my graces, and I'm grateful because God keeps putting me in spaces where I have to use that which God has given me to positively impact other people's lives. Now from this, I'm getting challenged to now disciple others because that is something that I have not intentionally done. And I love that I'm in the space where I am also being discipled. Yeah, yes. I love it. Now, I, I need to end just because it's tea time, but here's what I want to say, guys. Oh, we don't <laughs> We're going to be here. We're going to be here. There's lots of stuff. I, 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 we have community. Come on. I like it. Who needs tea when we have community? Here, here's what I want to say, guys. It's so important that you know your identity, which is the source of your authority. If you're going around making disciples without your identity firmly rooted, then you become like the Pharisees because they are making sons of hell. They were passing on things that were not going to give people eternal impact. Wow. But when you're connected, like Jesus was, then you know that whatever you're calling people into, it's worth it. It's worth it for you to follow me because I know the one I'm following. And one of the ways that God gives us to do that, He puts us in family. He puts us in a space where I follow as people follow me. People are following me and I'm following. And graces are going down. And guess what happens? You have a specific grace that is unique to you. There are things that God has given you that are unique to you. And I bless God for that. But understand this, that by themselves, they will only cause diversion. So you need to be able to understand how do the graces of the house impact the unique graces I have. Because every generation gets greater. Are you understanding that? So because I, I, was a, I thought I was a gifted young man, and I, and I was, maybe, but by understanding the graces in Pastor Oscar's life, in Bishop Oscar's life, and following hard, several of his graces came to me. Bishop Oscar is a man of excellence. Wow. Lois, you need to know where it came from. <laughs> it didn't just show up. Bishop Oscar is a man of excellence. And he taught me excellence. I was not a person of excellence. For me, I'm, I'm, my doctrine is the doctrine of good enough. Left to myself, good enough is good enough. But for pa Pastor Oscar, it, it was like, no. If it's for God's work, you level up. Ten minutes to time is on time. On time is late. Ten minutes after time, my disciples know. If you come, if you come at ten past to, to a meeting with me, that's disrespectful. You haven't called and then you run in and it's like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm like, what do you mean you're sorry? I've been waiting for 10 minutes. You should have texted. 
You should have called me a long time before. You should have planned ahead. Because that's how I was taught. That's not my natural self. He's a man of deep intellect. He believes in giving God his best mind. In researching, in studying the word. He taught me that. I didn't have that. I would not have had that if not for him. He taught me about being excellent with my family. <laughs> and having standards for my kids as well. And discipling them. About being intentional about my marriage. Your marriage, that's where it came from. <laughs> what you say in Pastor James and Dorcas actually came from Bishop Oscar. And it came to us. And it came to them. And it came to you. Grace is flowing down. That's what happens. So, so you need to be able to understand that there is a grace for you to get. Then, when I had these graces, one of the things that happens is I have my own things that are unique to me. Uh, he's very focused. I'm very relaxed. Don't worry, be happy. I love to hug. I love to laugh. I love to laugh. The real me. What you guys used to see when you're interns is Pastor Oscar. <laughs> but you know what? I realize there's something unique I bring that he didn't give me. Because every child is unique. Do you, have, do you realize even your children, when you look at them, they all are different? So now that could come out, but it came out best with the discipline that I received from my father. Left to myself, I'd have loved people, been a happy person, everybody would have felt embraced, and I would never have gone anywhere. So that's why that second question is important. Do you know the graces of your discipler? Because God, for some reason, allowed you to have those graces to complement what He's already given you to help you become who He's calling you to be. And if you didn't know that, you're going to end up being mediocre because the gifts God gave you are not enough. You need a cover. You need somebody to expose those gifts. These guys were already fishermen. They were excellent at fishing, but they needed to become fishers of men. So God had already given them something. You said it. Somebody who said it. Yeah, they're already patient. They already had those qualities. But without Jesus, those qualities would have stayed with the fish. Today, we name our children after them. So are you surrendered? Are you following? Because by yourself, yes, you're going to sing around and you're going to become, you're going to do many, many things. I used to say those days, I was taught to say that, you know what? Uh, many people who are very gifted, they get ahead in life by jumping as high as they can to see far. And I said, I learned a secret a long time ago. I stand on the shoulder of giants. And you know, there are people who are much more gifted than me who are jumping up and down. And they can jump much farther than I can if we were jumping at the same level. But that's the problem. We're not at the same level. I stood on Bishop Oscar's shoulders and I could see so much farther with, so less, with a lot less effort because I was standing on the shoulders of giants. God is, put, God is raising giants among us. And you may not even have recognized the grace in your disciple. You need to look for it. That person who's leading your discipleship group, there's a grace that they have. They may be younger than you, but there's a grace they have. They may be less educated than you, but there's a grace they have. They may not know as much as you have and maybe have been Christians a shorter time th than you, but there's a grace that they have. You need to look for that grace. Tap into it and grow from it. And as they tap into their follower, they're, as they're following hard and you're following hard, guess what happens? The graces of this house become the graces that you have. And then you end up, like Jesus says to his disciples, you will do greater things than these. Guys, I've no doubt that for all of you who are following in this house, you will do greater things than Pastor Caro and I. You have no choice. Because you will receive everything we have. Then you will receive everything your network pastor has. Then you'll receive because he's modified it. Then you're going to receive everything your campus pastor has. And then you will have what you already have. So surely you have to be greater than all the generations ahead of you. Are you understanding this? It's so different from the way the world thinks. Because the world thinks, let me be original. Let me do my thing. It's so overrated. It's so overrated. So God is calling us in this season to learn how to follow. Because as we follow, then we begin to understand the graces of the house and make them our own. And then we begin to understand our own grace and how we can then add to what we've been given. And then we do greater things than even Jesus himself did because he's with the Father. Am I speaking to somebody in the house? All right, we're going to take a break for tea. We're going to come back and just get even deeper. Tell your neighbor we're getting deeper today. Someone shout, I'm understanding. Yeah, this is where we are. We are understanding. God is beginning to open our minds to spiritual reality. Let me invite our MC to tell us what the next plan is.